If you've been following this series of videos, you'll know I'm going through the many forces that steal from you throughout your life. Not petty stealing, but stealing things like your land, your time, and your body. Today we're looking at property. Property is the reason you own nothing. It's also the reason that the system is so hard to change. Property is not just stuff, it's a relationship. You're in a relationship with someone else's property, whether you realize it or not. And it's abusive. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel that auto-played after you'd watched all the videos on the funny channels. Before I go too far, let's thank today's sponsor, a subsidiary of our last one, Adam, Eve, and Steve. The polyamorous Christian underwear store. Because it's Adam and Eve, but what about Steve? The claim the right wing makes is capitalism lets you own property, while socialism, which they're really bad at defining because they want a really limited working definition so they can say why it's wrong, socialism supposedly means you have no property because the government owns it on behalf of the people. Some socialists do think that way, sure, but I certainly do not. Like everything else I critique, this belief shows we're still confined to the narrow definitions we pick up from the propaganda. When we think of property, we tend to think of houses or possessions. But to really understand the term in philosophy and political economy, don't think of stuff, but of a kind of relationship. I went into this topic indirectly in my video on profit where I get you to think about how profit poisons any relationship. Property comes with a set of laws and norms attached to it. People who own property have certain legal rights. You may remember I'm on record as saying you have no rights, but that's because I assume you don't own any property. Or if you do, it's property in the informal sense of possessions, like owning your own home. These things aren't really property by the definition we're going with, though, because they can be taken away from you if you just miss a couple of payments or don't pay tax. Or maybe you just live somewhere the police commit civil asset forfeiture, which means police stealing your stuff because they say it committed a crime. The means of subsistence, you know, the things we need to live, are not property, as we know from every act of original expropriation, which we learned about in part two of this series, because property is protected by law. What you have can be taken away from you by law. If you own businesses, on the other hand, you suddenly have rights. The stuff you own, especially the intangible stuff that only exists on paper, like corporations, patents, and bank balances, is now the responsibility of the state to protect. Have you ever heard, property is theft? As far as we know, it comes from Pierre-Joseph Proudhon in his book, What is Property? What did he mean? Let's start with the example Proudhon and everyone else talking about Proudhon uses, an apple tree. Let's say you go somewhere and plant an apple tree. You've turned land that was not immediately being used into something that is of use to humans. Outside of a thought experiment, your planting a tree affects other living things, so there are all kinds of ethical considerations. Who else depends on this land? Not just humans, but other organisms. What are you taking away from the land, and how will it affect the area around? But I'm not really well versed on ecology, so let's stick to how this tree affects humans. If you plant an apple tree and share it with the people around you, then the tree's not the property of anyone. It's just there. Under capitalism, property is something you own mainly for the purpose of making a profit. If you put a fence around the tree and claim all the apples as your own, now we have a problem. After all, no one asked you to plant a tree. None of us were asked if we consented to you claiming a piece of nature for yourself and thereby taking it away from all the rest of us. It's not necessarily wrong of you to plant the tree. We all get hungry, after all. 
The problem is when you decide you own that tree and won't let the rest of us have any apples unless we pay. Given the reality of property, we know the problem is much bigger than an apple tree. All the best land everywhere in the world is owned by the people with the best money. Traditional hunting and fishing grounds get fenced off. Native people get kicked off their land and forced to settle and wear ties and get jobs. You might have a tiny plot of land where you can grow some herbs and tomatoes, but the land you would need to sustain yourself has all been privatized. It's been stolen from us. Property is integral to capitalism, and like all aspects of capitalism, it's been imposed on people the world over. Practically every inch of space around you, wherever you live, is privately owned by landlords, corporations, and the state. You can't go to the bathroom in public without their permission. You can't hang out with friends in public without their permission. You can't take shelter from the rain and cold without their permission. You can't drink water and eat food without paying for the privilege. And the main job of police and security is to enforce this legal regime. You can think about what it means if you put yourself in the shoes of a homeless person, you know, a victim of property. Where can they go? Huge swaths of land are just there waiting for you to squat, but the police will attack you for it because someone has paid money for it. You can't stay in anyone's place because none of them will let you. You can't stay in some office or store even when it's closed. You can't stay in so-called public places like parks. The police will move you from there too. If you don't have money, you see, you're not included in the public. Many of these businesses and cities will erect hostile infrastructure because even sleeping outside my property is forbidden. You can try to stay on the sidewalk, but people step on you and curse at you, and the police will still do what they like to you. So what happens when newcomers arrive and there's no space and no resources for them? In a capitalist system, the legal answer is you work for the people who own property, and they give you money, thus allowing you to survive a little longer. This couldn't be considered a fair system because having money says nothing about how one acquired it. It tends to mean some people worked really hard to build that pile of money, and the owner of the machines or whatever took the benefit. The newcomers either have to work for the owners at whatever their conditions are, or steal back everything they stole. That's the relationship we have with property today. So why consider owning property as a right we should value. Sure, we have the right to own property, but unless we're rich, we don't own property. So what use is the right? I mean, believe you have whatever rights you want. It doesn't change your situation. On paper, we also have the right to freedom, justice, and democracy. In practice, we have none of those things. That's what they meant in the Communist Manifesto when they said, you're horrified at our intending to do away with private property, but in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Property and capital, similar, are some of the chief justifications of the modern capitalist system. Look what we're taught. You have to do what capital demands, or the economy will collapse. We have to respect other people's property. Anyone can get rich thanks to these arrangements. I've made this argument elsewhere, but it begs the question to, to assume something is legitimate just because of money or property. What I mean is, just because you paid money for something doesn't mean whatever you do with it is fine and nobody else's business. If you take a bunch of land and say, now no one else can have anything on this land without your permission, why should we just accept that? Aside from the threat of violence, that is. No other reason than that we've been taught to believe in property. Incidentally, the nation state, the country, 
is a kind of property owned by the ruling class collectively. Well, that went over. Now it should be clear why property crime is crime. The whole legal system exists to protect it. Once, everything was commons. The land wasn't owned, but shared. But at some point in the past few thousand years, and for most places in the world, just the past few hundred years, the commons was taken from the people. It became property, owned exclusively and defended with force. In taking control of the commons, the powerful could deprive locals of their livelihoods and make them work for the king or whoever. Soon they're forced to use money, as I explained in part one, which means they need to acquire money somehow. Later, they're forced to work all the time, as in part two, because now they're not just paying for tax, but everything. Some could work, but others couldn't, maybe due to disability or maybe because the work wasn't available. But they still had to pay taxes in the currency, so they still had to acquire money somehow. Some of them worked, some of them starved, some of them stole. You can see the history of theft parallels the history of money and property. Wealth is stolen from the labor of people reduced to poverty. Why shouldn't they steal some of it back? You can come up with whatever excuses for treating criminals like dirt, but if you never ask why they do it, you might care a little too much about the law and not quite enough about justice. The news media inundate us with individual stories of petty crime and never talk about corporate crime. You can be forgiven for not knowing wage theft is a far bigger problem in every way than property crime. The capitalist class wants us to think there's this huge problem of evil thieves running around, so we approve of harsh measures against them. Did you hear about this story? This is our relationship to property. Two weeks ago, an employee at Walgreens shot a pregnant woman he said he thought was shoplifting. This is the inevitable outcome of valuing property more than human life. One turning point in the history of property I could have covered in parts two or three but didn't was the game laws. I talked about the enclosure acts and the witch hunts, but there were other factors in the invention of capitalism. The game laws were a holdover from feudalism, and resistance to them is where we get the legend of Robin Hood. In 1671, they were revived explicitly to reduce people's independence and force them into trades. The poor used to have the unofficial right to at least hunt and gather food on land that was technically owned by lords. The game laws, along with the Enclosure Acts, made private property an absolute. It made trespassing, fishing, poaching, and hunting illegal, closing off huge tracts of land to people and taking away their livelihood. They even enclosed the fields people played sports on. But don't worry, they said. We've built sweatshops, brothels, and prison camps for you to work yourself to death in. Thousands were convicted in Britain under these laws, and a few dozen were executed. Poaching game became tantamount to challenging property rights, which we all know today is a sin against capital. A famous poem was written about it. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common but lets the greater felon loose who steals the common from the goose. Even after the harsh game laws ceased to carry much weight in Britain, their influence persisted in other parts of the world. When the Western European nations extended their domination to peripheral regions, they were quick to draw on their experience with the game laws. For example, in French Equatorial Africa, the Manja people were banned from hunting. Since these people had almost no livestock, hunting provided a major source of meat. This ban was effective in forcing the manja to work on the French cotton plantations. The consequence of having no property is people who have it think it's okay to conquer and subjugate you. Ayn Rand said it was just fine to take all the land from Native Americans because they had no concept of property and rights.
She didn't care much if in taking that land there was a genocide. Because as she said, they were savages and white people were civilized. So it's okay to do whatever you want to them. She was reflecting the mindset of the European empires that forced capitalism on the world. Even if you're not the victim of colonialism, you are the victim of capitalism. The fact that you own no property means you have to work or steal to survive. It doesn't matter whether you personally agree with this arrangement, that a few people own everything and you have to work for them, because property laws entrench it. And when I say property laws, I mean the whole basis of the capitalist system. Of course, exclusive ownership is characteristic of any hierarchical relationship, which is a reason to oppose hierarchy on principle. But while many systems put up walls, capitalism is the only one based entirely on property, creating it, expanding your pile, and protecting it. Social hierarchy always exists to protect the privileges that the people on top get out of the system they impose on everyone. But it's only under capitalism that the whole purpose of the state is to expand and protect the wealth of the wealthy. Everything it does either flows from that or is of secondary importance. The highest priority of the police is to protect property. If you own property and that property is threatened, the police will stand in front of it. Or do you think the police in this city are actually finished catching all the murderers? so they had time just left over to guard a bank. Hard to tell from just a photo, I agree. Because of the structure of this system of accumulation, property gets ever more concentrated in ever fewer hands. Think of the way the economy works, you know, actually works. It's not just a bunch of firms competing with each other on a level playing field. Firms supposedly in competition make virtually indistinguishable products for similar prices. Most of the biggest firms in any industry are owned by a handful of corporations, which are owned by a handful of hedge funds and investment banks that control trillions in wealth, which are owned, in turn, by a handful of investors. They buy out or ruin their competitors, so there's ever less choice, and as a result, nowadays we have to buy most things from large businesses. More and more goes to the people on the top, leaving less wealth and more obligations for everyone else. That's why, as long as there's poverty, I don't care about theft and property damage. I don't care if the thieves weren't actually poor, or if they were stealing merchandise and not food, since the threat of poverty is always around the corner. I don't care about trespassing, loitering, camping, or any other inconvenience caused by the presence of homeless people when there's plenty of empty space they could inhabit but are still forced to vacate. All space has been commodified which means stolen from us and turned into an object for making money. As long as I have a place to stay, it's not such a big deal for me personally, but for anyone who finds themselves without a home, they've effectively been robbed. Not by individuals so much as by a system that privatizes every aspect of life and doesn't care if you can't afford it. When you privatize or commodify something, you steal it from everyone. We could all have places to stay, to visit, to meet, to grow food, to walk through nature, and so on, but all land is ultimately owned by the state, and it leases out huge swaths of it to private owners. We could all have food, but the farmland, the facilities, the stores, the trucks, and all the food are owned by corporations. So if we don't pay whatever they demand, a price that's always rising, of course, we don't get to eat. They've stolen the food that we all need by commodifying it. And by owning land, food, and other natural resources, this system has turned most nature around the world into privately owned profit-making ventures. It seems absurd to say that by privatizing nature, they steal it from everyone. You can't steal something that doesn't belong to anybody, right? But that changed a couple of hundred years ago.
capitalist property norms as we know them were first imposed on the English and Welsh, then on the Irish, notoriously to disastrous effect, then on the rest of the world through imperialism. Something you couldn't steal became owned by a few people. Now, if you eat something you're not permitted to eat, you're the one who's stealing, and you might get locked in a cage for it. Everything is commodified under modern capitalism. Everything. Not just the things you need, but the things you didn't realize you need. Like formulas for medicines. Like how your data gets collected and sold. The information produced in universities, including state-subsidized ones, gets handed over to corporations and states. Culture and stories get owned by Disney. And there's increasingly less space to just go and just exist without paying money. Some people would argue the solution to the problem of property is the one I mentioned at the beginning, to concentrate the authority granted to property owners in the hands of the state. If you've been on this channel long, you know I strongly disagree. The act would not eliminate property or the relationship of the propertyless to property. Just because something is officially, nominally public doesn't mean you or I can go there, have some, or change it. Just because it's state-run doesn't mean it's not going to end up in the hands of, or indirectly benefiting, property owners. They could just use eminent domain. State decisions are not open to the public, so state regulators and enterprises, already privately run, are easily influenced by lobbyists. Public versus private is a false dichotomy when everything is under the control of a few decision-makers regardless. No, no. We can do better. You can imagine what life would be like without property. People would still have their personal possessions, like clothes and toothbrushes, but if they wanted, say, a basketball, a bike, a car, a hammer, or a tractor, they could use one of the ones not being used. If we needed more, we could make more and the machines would be there for anyone to use. If there's an outdoor space you want to go to, you go there. Unless, of course, it's ecologically fragile. If you wanted food, you would go get it from where it's growing. People could manage resources sustainably, rather than with the huge inefficiencies involved in making them profitable. Why would we waste so much food, or use so much plastic, if the bottom line weren't our only concern? Everyone would have homes, and if you didn't have a home, we'd build you one. No one would be forced to make money, so no one would be forced to work, so no one would have to commute, so we wouldn't need as many vehicles, and wouldn't create as much pollution. We could all have a say when a decision needs to be made on the systems we rely on, like water, hospitals, and parks. We could turn what are now corporate spaces into public space, where we meet and talk and learn from each other, without having to pay money for coffee or apply for permits. News, information, ideas, formulas, and processes would be knowledge available to everyone. No one would be in competition with each other for money, so there'd be no more walls to sharing knowledge and collaborating. No one would buy your data to trick you into buying stuff you don't need. As Kropotkin summed it up in The Conquest of Bread, the means of production being the collective work of humanity, the product should be the collective property of the human race. Individual appropriation is neither just nor serviceable. All belongs to all. All things are for all people, since all people have need of them, since all people have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it's not possible to evaluate every one's part in the production of the world's wealth. I don't know if we'll achieve a world like that in my lifetime, but it's worth working toward, don't you think?